Don't go to a museum with a destination. Museums are wormholes to other worlds. They are ecstasy machines. Follow your eyes wherever they lead you, and the world should begin to change for you. Jerry Saltz. I'm Blakely Thomas Aguilar, and this is Pop Culture Tech, an original podcast brought to you by VMware. One of my very first school age memories is a field trip to the Natural History Museum. I remember walking in so tiny and being absolutely dumbstruck by the giant dinosaur skeleton filling the entire atrium. And that's when my museum obsession began. Now, every city I visit, every time family comes to town, the museum is a standard part of the itinerary. But when the pandemic hit, that all changed. No more work trips, no more vacations, no more family visits. And I miss the escapism that only art can provide, the otherworldly perspectives that transport you from this reality into somebody else's. Fortunately, we're living in an incredible era where digital technology helps us transcend the visible and journey into the virtual. Museums across the globe have rose to the challenge enabling communities with a little escape in a time of global upheaval. One of those museums is right in my backyard. Here's Rand Suffolk, director at the High Museum of Art in Atlanta, Georgia. There was a a very famous art historian that many, many decades ago kind of reminded everyone that the work of art is the event. And I think that as an art institution, we have to kind of continue to focus on that. It's not only the extraordinary um, sort of immersive opportunities and experiences that institutions are able to provide that can that can move people. And as I was mentioning before, really challenge you to to leave the museum thinking about the world in a very different fashion. Technology for us, I think that that comes into play. But candidly, one of the most, um, I think, experiential and immersive experiences we had at the museum was our 2019 presentation of the Yoyoi Kusama exhibition. And that was a show that candidly was transformative for many people, but was based simply on, you know, mirrors. Um, and, you know, there wasn't a great deal of technology there. So there's there's opportunities, I think, uh, for technology to play a very important role, um, but it's not necessarily definitive in terms of transforming that experience. I think we tend to look in some respects at technology's ability uh, in kind of four key areas, I would say. One is, in fact, that in-gallery experience. It starts with the artists that choose to embrace it, but then how do we use it as a tool from a didactic standpoint to encourage people to engage more deeply with that work? Um, we also, as an institution, look at technology from the social standpoint, right? How are we pushing it on our social uh, channels? Are we engaging people more deeply with uh, building a community around the art and the institution itself? Um, there's some of the transactional logistics components, for lack of a better phrase. You know, How do we create a seamless visitor experience. So from the time you go on our website and purchase your tickets to when you get here and go through our admissions line and so forth, how are we making sure that we're making that as seamless and as easy as possible uh, for our visitors? Um, And then we do some data collection with that uh, as well. You know, we want to measure stuff. And so we do on-site surveys. We also collect on occasion some mobile phone phone data all in an effort to make sure that we're reaching the broadest possible audience, uh, but also to make sure that we're, we're really having an impact. The pandemic forced a massive shift towards digital engagement. And as a result, institutions like the High Museum had to get digitally creative to support their communities. You really can kind of uh, draw a line between pre-COVID and post-COVID. You know, pre-COVID, as I was saying, we we used it, um, technology very differently. Um, you know, everything from our in-gallery experiences to kind of create a multifaceted approach and understanding of the work. Um, you know, we had a, a print and a digital version of our quarterly magazine. Um, we have, you know, blog on Medium and so forth. Uh, but 
with COVID, one of the things that uh, I've mentioned before is that we realized that while our mission did not change, the way in which we did business had to change. And I think we really jumped into what I would call sort of a laboratory moment for at least the first five months uh, while we were closed. So essentially from mid-March until July, um, we really went into just idea generation mode. And I have to give a ton of credit to our staff for relentlessly trying to figure out how do we move uh, what we do, as you said, as a visual art institution, which is really very much about the place and the physical attributes of the work on display. How do we effectively move that to the virtual realm? And I think we did it in in a number of ways. We, you know, we started creating, I think we've got something like 45 or 50 uh, Zoom backgrounds uh, that highlight works of art from our collection that people can download. Uh, We made a big push Uh, through our social media channels uh, to try and add programming, to try and provide inspirational distraction uh, for people and so forth as we all collectively kind of suffered through the, the same crisis. Part of the transformation was in the way museums deliver content to its audiences. Another part is thematic delivery, choosing the artists and experiences that help communities cope with and grow through such a tumultuous time. I think we moved essentially from that laboratory space to much more of an editing process. You know, of the 16 great new ideas that we developed, what were the three to five that we thought might have legs, that might continue to have a generative impact? Um, we've moved some key programs like Conversation Pieces, which is a 30-minute a interactive uh, focus on one work of art that's really encouraged to to, to really exist to encourage dialogue regarding that one specific work. We've developed programs like Masterworks and Mindfulness, again, to kind of give people a different space to kind of deal with their, the, the lives that we're all living right now. We've done our curatorial talks um, and, and artistic talks have moved online. So there's been a number of ways in which we've kind of moved in that direction. I think also from a very practical standpoint, you know, we're doing things that we never did before. We're now doing virtual sort of media previews of our exhibitions. Um, there are times when we're doing the installation of shows that via, you know, Zoom or FaceTime, you know, we're walking around the galleries with our iPads and, and talking to colleagues or with the artists themselves to make sure that they're comfortable with the installation and so forth. So it's been a very interesting transition during this time. And I think now we're trying to, again, figure out what is it that it has the greatest potential for us moving forward. And we've got some additional ideas in that respect. It's been a challenge. I mean, nothing is easy right now. And what I think has been important for us and a little bit of a touchstone is sort of our commitment to try and figure out how could we continue to be of service to our community? You know, how could we continue to try, even within that virtual space, to dovetail our institution's strengths with our community's needs? The traditional museum experience certainly transformed. But what's incredible about art is its ability to adapt and ultimately transform its expression. When researching this episode, one of my dear friends focused my attention on a really cool interactive experience, the immersive Van Gogh exhibit. This experience is popping up in different cities all over the world, and its popularity continues to grow, and for very good reason. To put it simply, it enables you to be physically inside Van Gogh's paintings. The building's architecture becomes part of the painting and you a character upon the canvas. To help us dive into the experience and the tech behind the scenes, here's Corey Ross and Svetlana Zboretsky from Lighthouse Immersive. This breaks what we call in theater the fourth wall. So you're no longer the audience sitting in your chair um, in the audience and what's uh, uh, occurring is happening on stage. Uh, and you're no longer visiting an art gallery where, um, you know, your observation of the art is, is the piece as it was originally conceived um, uh, on the wall. Um, this is, uh, is what it sounds like, immersive. It's, it's around you on 360 degrees. It's projected on every part of the room on the floor and it's projected on you. Um, And when that happens, you have a totally different experience um, of of the art. Uh, And uh, and it's quite um, emotional. And it's it's, it's just a kind of a new way of looking at it. When we observe people who come to our exhibit, 
we see a very a, 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 a very wide uh, range of emotions being expressed. Some people cry, some people laugh, some people dance. We see a lot of that. Um, some people just lay down on the floor and get into the meditative state. And I think this is a very interesting um a very interesting uh, effect that this kind of art makes on people. Like it's not, uh, it evokes a particular emotions, depends on the state that you're in and you might come back and, and feel very different, but that's just sort of reconfirms what uh, we've said before. It's get into you. And, um, and all of a sudden, a lot of people like really want to express how they feel and they, they're, they're free to do so. We're working with really the pioneer in this area, a gentleman named Massimiliano Sicardi is the designer of Immersive Van Gogh. And what Massimiliano does is almost to art what a DJ would do with sampling. He's going to choose bits that he thinks are important and reveal them in interesting ways and remix them with other pieces of art and, and then map it to the architecture and incorporate the architecture in the building and then coordinate it with music. It's, it, it's, it is a new piece of art. So um, it's not that you're coming and seeing art on the wall or even some effort to recreate um, what you would experience in uh, a traditional gallery. Um, it is completely new. Um, it is um, deconstructed uh, and reconstructed uh, in a way that reveals new elements of the art, new elements of Van Gogh's psychology, and really does capture you uh, and takes you to, into, a, into a complete world. So most of the process of the development of the technology and the integration of technology into these shows um, was done by Massimiliano long before we met him. Massimiliano um, Sicardi has been at this since the early 90s when he went into caves uh, in, in France and projected shows using slide old slide projectors and ran around. There was no computer animation. It was just slide projectors that he would run around um, and, and, uh, and, and create a show uh, manually flipping between slides and, and between projectors. Um, and really, um, the significant developments have been uh, that um, on, a, a, as computer animation has evolved over the last 30 years, uh, so has the animation of these shows. So that's a significant part of what's happening is, is simply um, the, the development of computer animation and being able to render the art and change the art and get into the art and bring the art to life um, uh, through animation. Um, then, uh, then the projection, of course, we're no longer using slide machines. We're using very high tech um, projectors. Um, in the case of our exhibit in Toronto, uh, it's all Panasonic um, equipment. Um, and, uh, and that technology includes sort of um, it really, I, I experience it as very much a layman because I'm not a techie. I'm a producer and I'm a, a, a person who experiences art. So um, mapping, uh, pixel mapping the walls and understanding you know, exactly where every, every pixel on the animation is going to fall and how it's all going to work together so that you don't have something weird happening when something is projected on a column or, or, or some part of the architecture that will then warp it and make the image look strange. Um, but that the storytelling still works and works within the architecture of the building is the first piece of so this pixel mapping technology uh, has, has come a long way in order to make that possible. Um, but um, the projectors themselves, we use, um, uh, dozens, uh, in, in the case of Chicago, will be hundreds of small projectors, uh, which was interesting to me because I thought that, um, you know, when, when we got into this, I thought it would be large projectors. And the important thing was how big the projector is. But actually, um, uh, the small projectors are able to focus on a smaller area of the wall and they're able to project from a tighter distance to the wall, which allows the public to approach the walls without casting shadows that would then obscure the image. To really experience the exhibition, you need to be there on site. And the pandemic with its shelter in place and social distancing mandates put the Toronto installation at risk before the doors even opened for the first time. Fortunately, the Lighthouse Immersive team got, well, creative.
Well, at, at the outset, it was uh, in, in March, April, it was really very frightening. Um, I have a really great team around me. I want to keep that team together. Um, they've been with me for years, most of them through thick and thin, through good shows, bad shows, good experiences, bad experiences. Um, and I was determined that we had to find a way um, to move forward. Um, uh, but it was very tricky. I and mean, if you can remember back, nobody knew what was happening um, or what would happen or when this would end or, or, or what could be. Um, and so like any entrepreneur, I spent a lot of sleepless nights staring at the ceiling, trying to figure out, well, what the heck am I going to do and how am I going to keep it all going? Um, and we have one thing that kind of caught in my mind, which is we had been renovating the space that was the former printing press room of the Toronto Star Building, which is right in the heart of Toronto, right downtown, uh, where it's hard to find parking. And uh, before COVID, this, all this renovation was going on, and I would drive down to a few times a week to see what was going on and talk with the construction workers and, and, and see what was doing. Um, and there was this old ramp that went up the side of the building that the Toronto Star used to have vans that would go up and fetch the newspapers. And so I would drive up this ramp and drive my car right into the construction site, right inside the building and park and get out of my car. This was a way to avoid trying to find parking or pay for parking really um, when I was only going down for 10 minute meetings. Um, but um, I realized staring at the ceiling in the middle of the night, trying to imagine what we could do in COVID um, that uh, if I could drive my car right into the gallery, um, potentially so could the public. Um, and this was kind of the seed of an idea before anyone was talking about drive-in, drive-in movies hadn't started, nothing had started. This is April. Um, and I thought, well, maybe we can do the world's first drive-in art exhibit. But as soon as we announced the drive-in, our ticket sales took off like a rocket. Um, and, uh, and we found that we were selling tickets for drive-in, but equally we were still selling tickets for walking. Um, and what eventually happened was that the government of Ontario passed a law saying that as of July 1st, walk-in and drive-in art exhibits, a concept that we had thought up, uh, would be allowed. Um, and they were going to open up and allow these two types of exhibits, uh, which gave us a problem because we only had one gallery. And I'd never imagined that we would have a public, um, you know, that we'd be allowed simultaneously to have both walk-in people and drive-in people. And I didn't know what to do with the tens of thousands of people who had bought drive-in tickets and the tens of thousands of people who bought walk-in tickets because we couldn't have them in together. Um, so we, we rushed it. We had two weeks before July 1st from when the government made this announcement. We uh, created a second gallery because thankfully there was enough space in the Toronto Star Building. And we created two galleries, which we've creatively called Gallery 1 and Gallery 2. Uh, and since July 1st, we've been running Van Gogh Walk-In in Gallery 1 and Van Gogh, what we call Go by Car, Van Gogh Drive-In in Gallery 2. Uh, and that way... Uh, we've managed to have 200,000 people come through the exhibit, uh, all of them safely. In the walk-in, we've done limited size capacity, and uh, we have social distancing circles that help people stay apart, um, and everyone wears a mask. Um, and, uh, uh, and in the drive-in, uh, people come in and stay in their cars. But so by, by offering both of these options, we've had an option for people who want to have the original walk through experience uh, and an option for people who are nervous and don't want to be um, outside of their cars. The only way to understand painting is to go and look at it. And if out of a million visitors, there is even one to whom art means something, that is enough to justify museums. Pierre Augusta Renoir. Thank you for listening to this episode and a special thanks to our expert guests, Brand Suffolk, Corey Ross, and Svetlana Zvoretsky for both joining our show and for bringing art into our lives in this incredibly challenging time. I'm Blakely Thomas Aguilar, and this is Pop Culture Tech. Our podcast is brought to you by VMware the software that powers the world's complex digital infrastructure. Learn more at VMware.com. Have questions about today's episode or just want to talk about your favorite art experiences over the past few years? Follow me at Blakely Ags and use hashtag PopCultureTech. Until next time. <laughs>